All right. Welcome, everyone. Dr. Anthony Crenetti, the fourth here, also known as Dr. Finance. You're on the Dr. Finance Live podcast. Welcome, folks. We got an amazing person here today. We got Stacey Cohen. She's one of the top PR agents in the state of New York and in the country, really. So Stacey's a good friend of mine from Clubhouse. We're doing amazing things over there. And I wanted to, to welcome her and give her a shout out today. She's, she, she's an expert in this field and has a lot of knowledge to offer. So welcome, Stacey. How are you? Great. Thank you, Dr. Finance. So glad to be here. An honor to have you, Stacey. Pleasure. So, Stacey, the format for today, we're going to do uh, maybe 15 minutes or so of your story. And then we're going to get into, I got about 20 questions, figure about a minute or two minutes each. Sure. I, okay. I, am, I am ready and raring to go. All right. Let's rock. So actually, let's do a quick 30 second snapshot before we get into your story. If you can just tell us about just like your bio in 30 seconds and then and then we'll get into your story. Sure, absolutely. I am CEO of a full service public relations marketing design company called Co-Communications, very diverse client base from real estate, healthcare, education, professional services, hospitality, and uh I'm doing a lot in economic development lately, which I know would resonate with you. And um, and my side hustle is um, I've been doing a lot in the personal branding space. And as you know, I have a book coming out in, in the spring on uh, personal branding. Yeah, that's incredible, Stacey. And we're, we're going to talk about your book uh, later on as well. I'm, by the way, I'm very, very proud of this book. So I uh, wish you the best of luck with that. Let's start with your story, though, Stacey. So you're originally from New York? Born in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> and um, uh, both my parents were, especially my father, serial entrepreneurs. And I actually started my first business at age 14. And um, so I had a, after college, I had a short stint in corporate. I worked at CBS. I also work for a big ad agency, but again, I think you know when, when you have that that entrepreneurship in your in your DNA, it's um, it's just crying to to get out. So um, again, I started really in entertainment PR. I worked internal CBS, um, their home video division, well before Netflix. And um, it was really exciting because I, I basically promoted film and um, sports. We had a, a licensing deal with the NBA. So worked with a lot of, of sports figures. And um, in the early 90s, when it was, I, I knew that I was going to have a family. I, I had just finished up my MBA in marketing, which CBS paid 100% for, which was a beautiful thing. And I started to freelance. I freelanced with different agencies. And there was uh, one agency in Connecticut. And they asked me to do an annual, write an annual report for a biotech company going public. And when I said to the head of the agency, you know, that I really needed to speak to the CEO to, you know, to get their essence, because it's, you know, again, it's like this is a company that's going public, and how can you how can you do it with with this silo? And the head of the agency said, "Oh, we don't let any of our independent contractors ever speak directly to our clients. So just feed me the questions, and then I will uh, get the answers for you." And then that was when I had my aha moment of starting the business, because communications works best when um, it can't work in a silo. You know, communications, it's, it's about collaboration. And um, I knew then that I wanted to work directly with the client. So in 1998, you know, again, after, uh, you know, short stint in corporate, I started co-communications from a spare bedroom, no lofty goals, just I wanted to do, um, agency and marketing and creativity in, in a different way. And I have to tell you that I have never looked back. And um, just to give you a little history about the name of the company Co-Communications, a lot of people automatically think, oh, you named the company after your last name Cohen, but that is not the case. 
If you think about the Latin derivative of co, it means with. So again, this is about collaboration and working with people to get the best possible results. And so we perceive of our clients as partners. As a matter of fact, I do not like the word vendors. It's like, get that, you know, get that out of our vocabulary. And I think it's also a reason we have a thriving uh, agency culture. We have excellent uh, retention of not just clients, one client uh, for 18 years, which is very unusual in agency land. And and some staff, um, many of my staff have been with the company for 10, 15 years. So, so again, it's, it's, the, it's the collaboration and working with people, empowering people, and it just runs through, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my DNA. So, so you, you're a highly successful entrepreneur. You actually started your own business in your bedroom. And it's been going on almost 25 years now. Yeah. And folks, this is a marketing slash PR agency. Is that correct, Stacy? Correct. Okay. So, so Stacy, let uh, by, kudos to you on that, by the way, because uh, you're doing amazing things. I want to just step back to um, your early childhood and just try to understand how you got into this field. So, you you grew up in Brooklyn um, as a identical twin. Yes, and, yes. Um, but I, I didn't. I didn't know that I was identical until about four or five years ago when when we took a DNA test. That's wow. like that's probably a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but you knew you were twins, though, right? Oh, of course. Yes. You guys look alike. Yes, but I, <laughs> I, but, but you know what? Identical twins, because again, they have like a ninety nine point nine percent DNA match for the most part, look identical. Like I'm three inches. She looks like my younger sister. Wow. Like I'm three inches taller than her, than her. And when you, when you take identical twins and you, let's say, put their hands together, their hands are like the same size. But if we put our hands together, they are not. So I don't know, something happened, nature versus nurture. And, um, you know, we, we found out because I, I, we just decided to do a DNA test. I always had like some doubt in my mind and we did a DNA test like just about like four or five years ago. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. Wow. So, so growing up, what was, uh, what was growing up in Brooklyn like? Did you have a lot of jobs and uh, entrepreneurial um, activities that, that led to your path? Well, it's interesting. I lived in Brooklyn until 10. And then my parents wanted us to move to the burbs. They thought that the schools were uh, better. So we moved to uh, northern suburbs of, of New York when I was 10 and lived there for eight years because my parents were always New York City people. Uh, my dad was in the fashion industry and would have to commute into the city every day. So as soon as myself and you know that I have two sisters as soon as we were in college they put that house on the market pretty fast and they moved back into Manhattan um, but yes yeah, so I lived there until I was 10 and then um, I you know I grew up with my mother always working she she liked to call herself a controller but she was really a bookkeeper and I remember and of course, these were the days before Excel and spreadsheets. So she would sit there with her, her ledger and, um, and, and my grandma lived in, you know, in Brooklyn, it was like very extended family. My grandma lived a couple of, of floors above us. I had like first cousins that lived in the apartment building next door. And um, she watched us. She watched us and, you know, my mom and dad work. And as a matter of fact, my dad held down two jobs then. He worked in sales um, in the fashion industry, but he also was a drummer in, um, in a band. And oh, wow. uh, yeah, yeah. And, and so- Wait a minute, Stacy. sorry to interrupt you. When I was researching, there's actually a Stacy Cohen that's, a, that's a, a, um, a singer in a band. Is that any relationship to you or- no, no. That's weird. As, as, she but, got a lot as, of views too. That's so interesting. I'll have to check it out. But as a matter of fact, what's interesting is there's a lot of musical talent in in um, 
in my family. I, it somehow passed over over me, but of course I went through the traditional piano lessons, but my cousin is Adina Menzel. I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, she was a, a Broadway star, Wicked, Rhett, and uh, if anyone has younger kids, they definitely know her from Frozen, Let It Go, the song Let It Go. But um, it passed over me, but um, you know, I think the creativity has played out in, in different ways for sure. <laughs> But not not as not a singer, not definitely not a singer. That's funny. Well, great speakers usually don't sing. I, I'm starting to figure that one out because <laughs> they, they got passed over me somehow. Too, so. <laughs> you know? so true. And then what what happened is is that you could see the work ethic I was born with. Yeah. Because my it's it's not like like either of my parents were given the silver spoon. As a matter of fact, both of my parents, um, you know, my, my mother's dad was a barber and my father lost his parents, both of them by the time he was age 17. So neither of them were college educated and, um, but they had a very strong work ethic and they just um, wanted to build a solid future for the family. So um, I definitely got their work ethic from then, uh, from them. And when we moved to to the Burbs, I babysat. You know, I've been I've been working since I can remember. But I remember my friend Jennifer and I were really frustrated because we were like, "Wow, you know, some of these kids are so difficult to babysit for." It's it's like you know, I wish there was a way to get more money. So we decided to start a business. So the suburbs where we were, there were a lot of like, you know, more fancy homes and dinner parties were, were a really big thing. And so we decided to start a, a business that a waitress service, like a home waitress service. And I remember there's like this local penny saver. It was like this, this print, and we put an ad, and I still remember the headline. It was like, we set, serve, and clean up. So we 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 invested in like a nurse's outfit. We went to like the, the local, like, uh, you know, like consignment shop. And so we ended up uh, going to these parties. And, and I have to tell you, it was a big bump over babysitting out, you know, hourly pay. It was like, I would say like 500%. Wow. And, and so what would happen is that people would see us there. We kept running the ads and people would see us, us at the parties and they would be like, oh, can I have your number? We were booked out for months. So that was, my, that was really my first business. And, um, and, you know, it just, Again, it's like starting a business, like so many people said, weren't you, weren't you scared? And I was like, no. And it probably wasn't the best timing to start a business because my husband, we had, um, you know, our girls were quite young, um, you know, and you could do the math. I have a, I have a 25 and a 28 year old. So they were quite young. And um my husband had just started his law practice. And so neither of us, there was not a steady income coming in. But I, you know, I think that's the key about entrepreneurship, right? You just, you're a risk taker and you kind of don't look back. You just look ahead. And it's, it's also, which both you and I have like that positivity, um, you know, that I can attitude and, um, and, you know, and just accepting that there's going to be bumps in the road, but you just, you always get to the other side. That's beautiful, Stacey. So uh, post-college, I mean, post-high school, you went on to get your degree, um, your bachelor's degree. Uh, what school did you go to? I went to Syracuse. And what's really interesting, oh, wow. what's really interesting is people right away say, oh, you went to Newhouse, which is their big uh, communication school. But that's not the case. I actually, I started out as pre-med and then um, decided to go into, so it was like a psychology 
human development degree. And so, and I thought I wanted to work with old people. So my last year, I ended up working at a, at a nursing home. So it was really like gerontology. And so my last year at Syracuse, I worked at a nursing home and I'd go into the nursing home and it was the craziest thing because it would be, I was given like a caseload of, of um, patients, if you will, uh, you know, that I would work with. And then what would happen, I'd, I'd go in for my, my uh, you know, my next day on the job and the supervisor would say to me, just like, oh, you know, it's, it's raining out, should be like, you know, over the weekend, your patient, you know, Miss, Mrs. Jones passed away. Like, like it was like nothing. And I guess like you do hard enough. But me, I would drive back to my campus apartment with tears streaming down my eyes. And I'd be like, I don't know that I, I'm going to do this. But what ended up happening is after I graduated, I decided I did not want to work with the elderly. And because I'm a people person, I said, maybe I'll try human resources. So that's where I landed at in HR at a big ad agency. You've probably heard of them, YNR, Young and Rubicam, and HR. And what happened when I was there and I would see all of the advertising and I would start asking the account execs, I'd be like, why did you design this down an ad like this and this down an ad like that? So I was just like, real. I, I was really interested in like, what type of, and, and of course now I'm all about marketing jargon, but like, what were you trying to convey to the, the, the customer, right? And, and who was the customer? Like, I was very interested in, in you know, the, the messaging behind the brand. And so then I realized I didn't love human resources, but I, I loved like this advertising world and how you can activate a customer, let's say to, to do something, to make a purchase, to, to choose you. I just found it so fascinating. So they, they actually uh, offered, ended up offering me a job in advertising and media buying. Um, but at the same time, I got offered a job at CBS in, in international marketing. And so I opted to leave for CBS. And it was there because my boss, who also graduated from Syracuse, knew my undergraduate degree was not in marketing. And he was great. He was such an incredible mentor. He said, you know what? He said, I can see you really like, you know, rising the ranks at CBS. He said, go back and get your MBA and it'll be 100% covered, even the books. So that's what I did. I went to school at, at night and um, it, took, it took a while to get my MBA because I had to also fit in. I ended up doing a lot of travel, um, but it took me five years to get my MBA. And interestingly enough, I got my MBA from Fordham Lincoln Center. And um, fast forward to now, they happen to be Fordham University is, is a client of ours. So um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, serendipity at, at its best, but it's, so what ended up happening is that I was there for a couple of years. I was in international marketing and I'd be looking at spreadsheets. And so I'm more of a people person and I totally respect what you do. I would be looking at, let's just say, like what return of the Jedi, Star Wars, how they'd be performing in the UK versus Japan. And my eyes would be so blear, you know, so bleary and I'd, I'd walk home like with headache, headaches like every single day. But I would always go visit the public relations department because they were always doing such great things. So I'd walk by and be like, oh, what are you working on? And they'd be like, oh, we're doing this like world premiere screening with like Mick Jagger, you know, because we also had all of the CBS music product. Wow. So I'd go back to my desk. And so after one CEO after another, they ended up reducing headcount. The first department to go was PR. My international marketing group, it was downsized, but my job was still safe. 
And I ended up running into the head of the PR department at some kind of event in, in New York City. And we were just talking, she had started an agency and CBS was her client because again, <laughs> They just wanted to reduce headcounting. You know that happens all the time. So she said, you know, Stacy, I'd love to meet you for breakfast. She said, I know you've never done anything in PR. She said, but I just think you're wired for it. Let's meet for breakfast. The next thing I know is I was hired and then CBS became my client. I became like a senior account executive. And I was really starting her, her business. Um, with her. And uh, it was just, it was such a great experience. And again, we had a lot of entertainment related clients. We had like Billboard magazine, we had Screen Actors Guild and, and talk about like PR, if you need to develop thick skin, go start with entertainment PR. Because, <laughs> because it's, it's, you know, it's like you there's just a lot of rejection. So you just have to develop thick skin and just like brush yourself off. So that's like, that's, um, you know, that's my, my backstory and, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> so Stacy, if you can bring us full to present uh, after that, I believe you said it before, if you just connect that dot. So at what point did you said, okay, I want to, I want to go start my own business. You had your, I guess you had your kids and then you, you, you took off some time or, yeah. Right. So, so after, after I had, um, after I had the kids, um, they were like one and five, but before that I had started freelancing with different marketing agencies, just doing freelance work when they were young. And, um, it was that one experience with, with preparing the annual, report for the biotech company that, that I decided I want to work directly with the client. And then co-communications was born. No, and, no animosity with the other person you were working with though. Like how did that, that relationship end? Like what was the, not, or not, not end, but how did that, that job end? Oh, no, it's, it's um, no, not whatsoever. It's um, you know, it, how can I put it to you? I look at everything. I believe in, never ever burn bridges you you just you never know when people are are going to come back into your life and no no animosity and, and again the kind of the kind of agencies that we ran were were so different you know we started out as more of a traditional pr agency but now we've evolved. So we build websites, we create logos, um, direct mail, e-blast, like anything really that comes under the marketing umbrella. Uh, whereas, you know, both of these agencies that, that I, I've worked with were, were quite different. Mm. Thank you, Stacey. That's, that's, a, that's a great question because no, I, um, you know, look, it's, it's like, it's difficult enough running running a business, and it's you know th there are there are times when when things get tough. Like you, you need I always say you need a, a personal board of advisors. So you you want and I, I know that you have that I have that you want to keep uh, you know certain people out there that you can rely on that when you when you need advice. And um, it's really important to, um, to, to really cultivate and continue relationships and, and keep them strong. Absolutely, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. So, and as of right now, you're still 25 years almost with co, uh, with your company, right? Co-communications. Co-communications. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and if you, if you see the, the picture behind me, I would say that that is our biggest achievement. Is get this is I you know again I know you're you're um, in Philadelphia area. Have you ever ridden over the Tappan Zee Bridge or now it's called the Mario Cuomo Bridge? This summer I did actually go see uh, our buddy. Um, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Bernie Siegel. I, I had to drive over that to go to Connecticut. Yeah. Ex oh, that's that's a that's a big drive. So we um, were the communications agency of record for. Um, 
the replacement of the Tappan Zee Bridge. And it was just, it was, I'm so proud of it because it was a, um, it was a very issue related campaign and we wanted to create some urgency around it. So we created a whole umbrella campaign like build the bridge now ny.org, largest um, public works project in, in New York state history. And um, it was really a matter of educating different stakeholders of why we needed to build the bridge like now. And, um, and of course, Governor Cuomo at the time was, was very, behind, you know, very behind it. He was not our direct client. We worked through the Construction Industry Council. But I can tell you, I never knew that I would know so much about building bridges. <laughs> And that's what I love about about my work, right? You just I, I'm just you're building bridges. Enough. You're you're connecting right. people yes, to their yes. future destination. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. All right, Stacy. So we're going to move into the next segment here. Um, I, I just have a series of questions. Figure about a minute each, and I think we'll make good timing. Um, first one. Let's talk about your books. So you actually, or or book? Yeah, books actually. We we are actually co-authors now. Um, for 13 books, 13 Steps to Riches book, um, uh, which is a part of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, took basically every chapter was, was taken, dissected into a separate book. And Stacy, if you don't mind me, correct me if, if I'm wrong on this story, but Stacy had always wanted to finish her book. She's been working on her own book for many years. And then Stacy and I met and I suggested her one day, why don't you jump in with us? I, I can ask a personal favor to get you in the series. And she said, yeah. And I knew, Stacy, that all you needed, because you already have the expertise. I know you can write. I know you're talented. All you needed was the, the push, because as a writer, I realized that the hardest thing to write is just like working out. It's the same thing. It's getting started. That's, that's like half the battle right there. And, all, and I knew that all you needed was to just get started. So I asked Eric Swanson if you could be in this 13 Books to Riches series and uh, Steps to Riches. And you've been not only in it so far, you've been so far, uh, I think we're on book eight or something, and you've been actively writing. And this was the momentum, was the force you needed because now you got your own book <laughs> finally, and it's, it's pretty much done. I'm actually going to endorse it. I mean, this, is, this is incredible. It's coming out next year, but I'll let you tell us all about this. Stacey. And, and first of all, I have to tell you, I am so grateful to you because I really feel that if it was not for you, that this book would be coming out in May. I don't know if you call it writer's block or what, whatever was going on, but I was, I was, I was stalled. So um, thank you, Dr. Finance. The, uh, the book um, is called the, uh, the, the book that is coming out in, in May is called Brand Up, The Ultimate Playbook for College and Career Success in the Digital Age. It's coming out by Post Hill Press. Distribution is Simon & Schuster, and it is coming out May 2023. Wow. And um, I am so excited about it. It, it definitely took a, a big turn. Originally, it was geared towards parents to help their kids navigate social media to, um, especially during college admissions, to, to put across their, their best self. Because as we know, college admissions is very different right now, especially since my, you know, since my kids went, it's 75% of admission officers are looking at applicants' social media. And it's really important to create a solid digital footprint. And it's not just for teens, it's, it's for all of us. You know, if you think about it, Google has become the new resume. And there is, consider this, this is a crazy statistic. In an internet minute, there are 4.1 million Google searches. So someone is probably Googling you right now Dr. Finance, like, what do you want them to find? So we all need to, to take control of this and really create our own digital footprint, footprint by becoming our own brand manager. But this book 
ends up because the publisher wanted me to pivot and I'm so glad that he did to a, a playbook for teens. So it's very interactive and it, it takes teens through, through self-awareness, you know, so through doing a self audit, finding out like, what is, what is their superpower? What are their strengths? What are their skills? What, what are, what are their passions? There's actually a chapter on networking, um, entrepreneurship, doing good, you know, developing empathy. Um, there's a chapter, I feel that every 16 year old should have, uh, should be on LinkedIn. And these are all 21st century skills that are just not acknowledged in many of, of the high schools. And just to back it up a little bit, I'm the main author but I have two contributing authors. Like I even believe in playing to my strength. Like Dr. Finance, you're an educator. I'm not an educator per se, but one of the, um, Alan Katzman and Jason Schaefer are contributing authors. And Jason helped me with a lot of the contributing, uh, with a lot of the exercises in, in the book. I met Jason about six years ago because I was writing for the Huffington Post then. And I just saw my kids in high school. I was like, wow, you got to start marketing yourself really young. And so I, I think it was my first or maybe it was my second Huffington Post blog. And so I, I did some research and I said, I wonder if any high schools are teaching kids how to put out their, their best digital selves, how to digital leadership, marketing themselves, figuring out what their superpower is found a school in Florida, in North Broward, and, um, and wrote about it in the article. And the article went viral. Um, it, was a, it was the importance of, of creating a, uh, a, a, a brand early, developing that muscle, and also um, learning how to market yourself. Uh, educational testing services contacted me. They uh, they asked to purchase worldwide rights for the article. And believe me, it wasn't a lot of money, but it still, it was, it was like, it was such an honor. And then I started to speak to Jason. I hadn't actually interviewed with him, wrote a second article. Um, he actually asked when I was in Florida visiting friends, if I would go to his classroom and see what he was doing. And then I, you know, I just, I had a wake up call. I'm like, this is something that needs to go into all classrooms, not even across the United States, across the world, but it really morphed because this class, believe it or not, that Jason was teaching in Florida, it was made mandatory at age 14. So these kids had to learn how to tell their story and figure out their, their superpower, if you will, at the age of 14, it was mandatory. Now, Jason, is all is now in Florida. He's he's now talking um, a lot about entrepreneurship. He's teaching entrepreneurship to middle school kids. Now you don't need to go into a business to think like an entrepreneur. And if you think about it, there's all these conversations about entrepreneurship, like being in a company. It's really all about innovation and risk taking, and and so. That prompted me to do a, a chapter on entrepreneurship. So the book kind of morphed, um, but the great news is, is that this book levels the playing field. It, it really is for anyone. You don't necessarily need to go to college or want to go to college to read this book. Think about it, you could want to go into a trade, into construction or be a hairdresser. And, this book will, will really help you define yourself and help you figure out how to put your best self forward. Stacy, in maybe 20 seconds, how, how, uh, who were some of the people that endorsed your book? So um, Barbara Corcoran, who, um, who is actually on the front cover. Wow. And, um, and, and also... Um, and also uh, Seth Godin and uh, David Meltzer. 
Wow. And I have a lot of I have a lot of educators, <laughs> Natasha Grano, who's who's a mindset coach, because I also have a section in the book. I, I believe that having a growth mindset is is really important. So I did interview Natasha about that. Um, you know, s- some other best selling authors and and of course you, which is, is a, a large honor, um, because you really understand. And I think you know from from your perspective, it's it's you are an educator, and you understand that students like to me financial literacy is like an essential skill that should be taught. Maybe not even in high school. Maybe even starting in elementary school. <laughs> So it's it's a it's a different world, and and again, my hope is that this playbook will be, uh, you know, will will be translated into many different languages and used by high schools around the world, and and really help kids um, give them an advantage, you know, because if you think about it, personal branding is about standing out. It's about like why should someone choose you? And it doesn't matter just, you know, the college applications. It's also think about a recruiter has has like a pile of, of resumes like up to here. How are you going to stand out? You know, and, and it's the same thing. If you have two applicants that look pretty similar, why would you choose one over the other? So I think we all have to figure out what is it that makes each of us unique and make sure that, that we can communicate that to our audience. That's brilliant. Thank you, Stacy. Appreciate that. So, all right. So Stacy, we got about 20 questions and um, I want to spend about 30 seconds to a minute, the most on each one, because I know you got a hard stop. So I want to talk about your TEDx title. So how did, how did it feel to speak on a TEDx stage? And, and what was the title of that um, video that actually got over a million views? Oh, wow. And, and I, I'm, thank you for watching it. it was, <laughs> I, I, I know that you did. So thank you for that. It um, when when um, initially working with with Deborah as as you know and um, I think it was like like about to do the TED, you know about to do the TEDx talk so the book title at first was was branding from from birth what's in a name and then we got feedback from some of the publishers like this is too wide of of a spread you know, that you really need to focus on, let's say, the high school years. But the TEDx talk uh, was was about starting with naming your child, starting with naming your child. Um, you know, that's that's the first impression that that we that we make um, so that parents had to be very uh, considerate in, in what they named their child. And I interviewed like baby naming experts. I never even knew there was, there was, there was a thing. So, and branding from birth, again, it, it really took you through um, childhood, through high school. I'm talking about a lot of the things that I just mentioned, of course, in, in elementary school, you want your, your kids to explore and discover, you know, sports, art, science, uh, but then when it gets to middle and, and high school to start being, uh, cons- you know, consider um, the importance of your digital footprint and also, um, you know, safety, privacy issues, which, again, I went into the first iteration of the book. There's a whole chapter dedicated to that. This book obviously changed. It's, it's again, more, more for teens. But it's also, again, figuring out, like, why should someone choose you? What, what is it that makes you stand out? Why, um, you know, how do you, here, here's the thing, personal branding, it's not about me, me, me. It's like, what is your value to others? And so if, if people of all ages, right, because personal branding is, is for life, and, and it's also, I would say personal branding is, is mobile. Um, you take it where you go. But if you think about it, it's like whether you're on a job interview or interviewing with a college admissions officer, you almost need to figure out how would you be of value 
to the campus. How, you, how would you be a value to a particular company? And, and again, this, this, go, this speaks to the TEDx talk, but I also bring in my experience as a twin. And just to, you know, just to make it short and sweet, I, you know, I grew up with a twin, which is a very different experience than being a singleton. Because being a twin, we shared a room all our life until we were 16. Especially when we were younger, we were given the same toys. My grandma, up until we were age eight, dressed us exactly like, you really need to work harder to create your, your, your own um, identity. And so I think that this is my life's purpose, right? To help people form their identity and really what their value is to the world. And I always say, because a lot of people will like hand over their resume and say, you know, like I'm having so much trouble like finding a job, you know, can, can you help? I'll be like, I'm not a resume writer, but what I know to, what to do and my superpower, whether it's a product, service, or person, I know how to package things. Because if I'm trying to sell you this pen, I need to get inside your mindset and understand why would Dr. Finance want to buy this pen? So it's not about the features of the pen, like, oh, this pen is red. It's like, Dr. Finance, this pen you can use in the dark. Like when you pop out of bed at night and want to take a note because it has a light on it and this pen writes faster. And you know, when you're in the car and have a thought, this pen has a tape recorder. So, you know, so it's, again, it's, it's about marketing is, is um, just anything, a product service or person is getting the value of, of you across. And, and so that's what I tried to establish in, in this TEDx talk. Th th thank you so much, Stacy. Brilliant response. Um, Stacy. maybe 30 seconds, but I have a few personal branding questions. So um, I'd like to stay focused so okay, that we yep, can, I'm gonna yep, build yep. up on What is the history of personal branding? Maybe 30 seconds. Can you just give us a quick summary? Was it always around? It seems like a modern it's concept to me. It's, it's always been around, but in 1998, this guy, uh, Tom Peters, uh, who uh, has management guru, he wrote an article for Fast Company magazine, uh, and he wrote, uh, we are the CEOs of, of our own company, the brand called you. So again, that's, that's, my, that's my response. We're all CEOs of ourselves. <laughs> and he really, he really coined the term personal branding. So it's only since 1998. Interesting. But it's been around a lot, a, a lot longer than that. Yeah. You know, I spoke to a woman who was a, a marketing expert from like the 60s and 70s. And she said that, uh, we'll, we'll talk about PR in a second, but she said that P, even PR wasn't around back then. They called it marketing. So I, you know what, I don't necessarily agree with that, but, um, you know, we, we can, we could talk, we could talk about that another time, like, because actually, and, and please forgive me because I forget the year, but I want to say like the first press release was generated by this guy, Ivy Lee for Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, which I want it dates back to the early you know, 1900s, like I'm thinking like 1938. And, and I, I like to fact check, so I'll provide you with the fact on that. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. it's cool to find out this stuff. It's, it's very interesting. Um, next question though, what other kinds of branding, going back to branding, sorry that I, I uh, diverted there, but what, what other kind of, kinds of branding are there besides personal branding? Uh, like for example, corporate branding, and, and why are they important? Maybe 30 seconds. Sure. Corporate branding, they're, they're really very, very similar, right? It's like even a corporate brand has to um, figure out, you know, what is, what is their unique value proposition? What, what is it? Like, you know, look, look at Nike versus Adidas. Like, why should you choose Nike over Adidas? It's like, what, what is it 
you know, what is going to activate the customer. And branding is is a lot more than than a logo and a brand identity. It's it's the brand story. It's the it's the uh, um, you know the culture. You you can you can feel the culture of of a Nike or or Adidas, um, and it's. I have to also tell you, a lot of times it's also the CEO of the company. I always think that brands, um, you know, when you have like a strong brand like a Nike, it's also a lot of times the CEO is, is such an important brand asset. And it's like, it's like a, a feeling. It's like, you know, how do you make someone a loyal customer? And I think the essence of branding is about trust and credibility. So the brands that create and I'll add in one more word, likability. Likability, trust, and credibility. Um, those are strong brands that you want to do business with. Brilliant. Thank you, Stacey. All right, Stacey, uh, what is more important, corporate or personal branding? In 30 seconds. So let's say, uh, uh, let, let, you know, let's say in your case, right? Um, and obviously you didn't turn it into a corporation, or maybe you did, I don't know, but... You, I, 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 we're actually an S corp. Are know? you really? Okay, oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. perfect example then. So your company, you know, you have your company and and, and uh, the the brand you built for that, and then you have the Stacy Ross Cohen, your individual personal brand. So what what's what's more important to have built yourself or the company's brand, uh, corporate versus personal? Maybe it, there, maybe both of them at the same time. I mean, we've had. Uh, Joe Foster, founder of Reebok here, who created Reebok, right? And then here he is in his 80s coming back to build a personal brand because he already created a company's brand. But later on, he realized he needs to build his personal brand so he can tell the story properly. So what, what's your, you know, what's your that, thoughts that's on a, that? That's a, it's, it's a great question. I, I think it's difficult to do both simultaneously. Um, so I would, I would say like, for, for those that are starting a business or, or you know, like relatively new businesses, it's, it's definitely important to really figure out the corporate brand and the, you know, the, the brand messaging around it and figuring out, you know, who are the target audiences, who, who are, um, who, who wants this product or service? And then figuring out your business objectives. You know, it's it's like how many units do you want to sell if it's if it's a product, or you know if if you have a whole slew of of services and if you can project your your revenue pie, you know what do you want to prioritize? So I think it's really important to focus on the corporate brand. But at the same time, I think you do need to be thoughtful about how you can start creating thought leadership leader, um, thought leadership. So all of us are subject matter experts in something. So what around your corporate brand can, can you put your stake in the ground and, and different than your, your competition? So you also need to look at the competition. So let's say if you're an IT company, it's like, like if, if, if you were an IT company and said, yeah, I want to go out with my expertise in, you know, cybersecurity, I'd be like, no, don't do it. That's what everybody does. Do, do you know what I'm saying? I'd be like, let's pick something different. And, and I don't know what, what that is, but let's pick something that you're a subject matter expert in, you know, I don't know, I'm just going to make this up, but, but artificial intelligence, you know, <laughs> and, and just like pick a niche that there's, there's not, that's not cluttered. So to some degree it is simultaneous, but I, I do think that to have the corporate brand built first and figuring out, it's, it's like, I never thought of building my brand first. It was like, it was the corporate brand. It was, it was the, the, what is behind co-communications. It's like, we have a tagline. Just see if I could find something for you because I, I know you'll you'll get it in a in a minute. We have a tagline, and it's called "Make Yourself Perfectly Clear," because think about it: the message has to be crystallized, right? And that's the most important aspect of branding. So I copyright, I trademark everything. So probably about like 
I don't know, 15 years ago, I said, my, so my trademark attorney, I said, we've been using the tagline, make yourself perfectly clear. I said, hey, can we trademark it? He said, yes. And then I came up with the idea, not that we use these anymore, but, but here's my business card. It's clear. If you go on my website, everything is about clear, clear success, clear results. So again, carrying through that, that brand, um, my brand at first was all I did was, was go out and speak about marketing and PR, but because of, of the book and especially my passion, I'm going out there talking more about, about branding. So Again, that's a great question, but I think, you know, you've got to really, you really got to get your corporate brand right, because here's the thing, you can't just come out with like a good product or service. It's got to be great. You've got to spend time making sure that your offering is better than anyone else's and that, that people need it, want it, and, and you're going to be able to activate them. Thank you, Stacy. Br brilliant, brilliant response. Stacy, um, going back to the PR thing now. So briefly, just I, I got a few um, questions that go in that direction. Is PR the same as marketing? What's your thoughts? Maybe 30 seconds. Oh, no. <laughs> and PR, PR is so misunderstood. That's such a great question because a lot of people, they're like, oh, you know, you're the spin doctors. Like PR is about spinning stories. And it's so not. Public relations is, is an essential marketing tool. And I would say it is the best tool to create trust and credibility because you're getting that third party endorsement. You're getting that validation. As a matter of fact, and, and I'll make this really short, but Bill Gates once said that if I was down to my last marketing dollar, I'd spend it on PR. Not that we have to worry that he's ever going to be back to his last marketing dollar, but it's still, it's, it's, um, I always say if you're, if you're a new brand, start with public relations, get, you know, get that media coverage. Now, media relations is just one aspect of public relations because to build thought leadership. A lot of times what we do for our clients is not just getting them media coverage, but it's, it's getting them out there speaking at industry conferences, right? Again, getting that subject matter expertise out, getting them closer to their target audiences, getting them to be the go-to person for, for X, Y, Z. But under the public relations umbrella, there's also crisis management, there's investor relations. So again, a lot of people just automatically go to that PR is just media coverage. But again, I would say it's the most powerful tool in, in um, someone's marketing toolbox. So, if, so then you're saying by default, it's it's not marketing, but it's a part of marketing, right? It's a special yes, part. Yes, yes, it's it's uh, right. It's a part of marketing, as is. If you looked at if you looked at it almost like an umbrella, one uh -huh. of the spokes would be public relations. One would be. Social um, media, advertising, social media, direct mail, and then you and there, there's also search engine marketing, search engine optimization. So all of these things, uh, you know, they, they cannot work in a silo. But also think about it when you go on someone's website and you see as seen or, or read someone's bio. And if you see as seen in The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Forbes, you right away, perception is reality. And so you right away say, wow, he or she is credible. So that's the beauty of, of media coverage is that, and you wanna make sure that you leverage it, that you, if you've been interviewed by, let's say the Wall Street Journal or Forbes, that you make sure that it lives on your website, it lives, it lives in, you know, on, on your bio, that you're making sure to push these articles out through your social media channels. And, um, and and again, it's like, I know myself when I go on a website to purchase a product, let's say, and I, I see like, I seen on Good Morning America, like, I'll be like, oh, let me let me check this out because I, I know, I know from behind the scenes, it is not easy to get on, on GMA. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that leads me to my next question. Great point. Um, is expensive public relations agencies are are they worth it? Because I mean, most of the most agencies out there, 
and this is this is my dance when I first was building my own brand. To, to, to people were trying to charge me anywhere between three and twenty thousand. I was bumping into a, a month. I'm like, I just want a website. Like, <laughs> you know what? Like, why why do I got to pay this? And there's no guarantees. So, I mean, is what's what's your thoughts? From what I heard, ninety five percent of them plus are really just a waste of money. They're just out there just you know, lurching for money. But I don't know. You tell me, Stacey. Well, think? well there, there are a lot of great PR agencies out there. And, and you're right. You're right. Like, there are a, most of the agencies in, in New York, like, when I hear the number $3,000, I'm like, wow, that's, that's really affordable. Because most of the agencies in New York, like, the minimum monthly retainer fee is $5,000. Wow. Look, it's all about return on, on investment. And it's picking the right partner, like like anything else. And you're right. Like I will, I will never guarantee a client that I will get them into the New York Times. And anyone that does that, that like if you know, like run, run away. Um, you know, it's th there is also there is some pay to play going on with with some more local media, but certainly the more regional national media it's it sales right because my team we're storytellers so we're we're trying to have a good understanding of the media's like readers or viewers and what's going to resonate with them and it's it really is like a lot of people think like Oh, you know, you can just get me on the front cover of New York Times. No, we we gotta like we gotta package like a really good story. We have to. There's so many ingredients that go into it, right? You you need to have an understanding of of like what the reporter has covered before and what could likely interest him. So I used to say in this business, like you need eyes in the front and and the back. Now you need like sensors all parts of, of your body. So you, you it, it's really, it's an art and it's a science. And I feel for people that are seeking like PR firms because I hear it all the time that like we get, we get in a lot of clients that say, you know, I went with an agency and I really didn't get the results that I would expect. So I, you know, I need to first hear that because I feel part of my job is, is managing expectations. But the best advice I have to just round this back up is, um, you know, look, there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers also, and it's quite easy, but just really like, like learn from the best and look at your competitor's website, see who, who's been covering them. I believe that every brand, every website should have a newsroom. You know, keeping that content fresh, generating news releases, talking about being able to change a digital footprint. We get asked every now and then, it's probably grown exponentially over the years, hey, the CEO of the company, you know, like if you Googling me as a negative result, could you suppress that? And it's, there's not an easy answer, but first of all, if, if all brands were sending out positive information through the media and different online news distribution services, at least the, when someone fell on that negative piece of information, they would say, well, 90% of, of you know, the other stories are, are really positive, but it's also, I've seen it done like by sending out online news releases, depending on the dome, it's, it's called a Moz value and, and I won't uh, bore you with it, but some things are kind of stuck on page one and not very easy to move. But by sending online news releases, we can um, get the, uh, we can basically own the first couple of pages of, of Google by again, putting out consistent good news. And if you think about it, communications works best. You can't just turn on the volume and then walk away. You need this consistent drumbeat, you know, so you consistently need to get different news out. And the news that you're getting out, 
I always look at news like a news value of one to 10 or zero to 10. It has to be as close to a 10 as, as possible. So if news that you're thinking about putting out is, is not you know, that high up, you got to figure out how to do so. Stacy, that's a good point. I wanted to just expand on that though. If someone has a strong brand and is an expert marketer, um, do they need a PR agency at all? Maybe 20 seconds. Not necessarily, you know what? Not necessarily, not necessarily, but they, they, they do need to. Um... I mean, just take me for example, right? So, uh, you know, over a million followers, um, I have a brand obviously. Uh, and I've already figured out how to do all this social media stuff and wrote from entrepreneur, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what, what benefit would, it, would PR do for a person like me? I mean, I can go and get, uh, become friends with the person that works at uh, whoever I'm missing, Forbes or whatever, and, and have them write an article about me, right? Like what, yeah. <laughs> what, yes. what, what would a PR company do different? Well, we have so many different, we have so many different tools that, that we use. And we also like, remember relationships, relationships is everything. And so we have a lot of, of deep and long relationships. And, and when you talk about trust being the most important thing in relationships, like our immediate contacts know that when we give them a story that that we that they can, they can trust us that we're going to give them a really good source and we're also going to get them everything that they need in a responsive way because uh, you know working on constant deadline whether it be um, you know a fact sheet or or like high quality photos you know a high resolution um, there's public relations is. I don't want to make it sound easy because it's not. It really is very complicated. And you also need to play chess. And so it's, you know, there's there's three components, right, of any communications. It's being really strategic, but it's also being creative because I guess where we can, um, and I wouldn't even say spin, but if a client comes to me with the story that I say, this is only like six news value. We have to inject creativity in it, and then, um, and then it's just like it's it's that precision. It's, I mean, if I think about it, like my team, a lot of my team are former um, journalists. It's just like it's a very it's a very different mindset. It's not anything I feel that you could just just uh, watch a YouTube video. I wish you couldn't say, oh, I got it. <laughs> there's, you have to, there's so many different layers that, that you need to think about. And you even need to think about like, like when you provide, let's just say you're, you're, you're talking, you're giving a financial literacy class to kids and you're, you're like, wow, this is just such a great, like, like, you know, and then you're talking to someone from Forbes about financial literacy and say, oh, I have a, I have a great picture, you know, to send you like of, of me working with kids. Oh, great. Send it. You know, don't, you know, don't forget that there's, you've got to dot all your I's and cross your T's because my question is like, do you have a release from, you know, from the parents of, of these kids that you can use that picture? That's just like how my mind works, you know, because so you have to like bring in like sometimes like like the the legal mindset, you know, it's the same thing when when we've handled like a lot of crisis situations. It's like, you know, we got to bring in the legal counsel. We got to bring in the science. We got to bring in, in the facts. So it's just a matter of, of thinking like media, but you could again, but when, when you pitch and a lot of times like news releases are not the way to go with the high tier media, it's coming to them with a pitch, but it's also coming to them with like, let's just say you don't know them. For, so for example, I personally, and I don't pitch as much as I used to. And then I, I know that, that we have to wrap it up. I don't pitch as much as we used to, but, but we, um, working with like a large healthcare organization, 
which has like 80 offices, their regional organization, the CEO really wanted to be in, you know, in cranes. And so the play on this was, was uh, technology. And I'm not going to get deep into it, but then I was like, okay, like, like, you know, again, I've been doing this so long, like, I was just like, okay, let me just find which reporter recently did a story on healthcare and technology, boom, contacted and read the article and said, I love the article and, and meant it, of course, I, I love the article that you wrote about, ro you know, robotics, and this is what my client is doing, is this something that would interest you? Within like an hour, I heard back from him, yes, I'm very interested in this. So it's like finding that that level ground. So it's like, again, it's like getting media coverage. It's, it's an art, it's a science, it's you know, gotta be strategic. Some of it is like really instinctual and also like having another story idea in your, in your back pocket. Because he might not like that, but he might, um, be agree agreeable to, um, you know, option A, option B type of thing. Thank you, Stacy. Stacy, on that point, why, why do many expert PR agencies fail to brand themselves? I mean, it seems like they have all the skill sets. They have all their marketing geniuses and PR geniuses, but they don't do it for themselves. They'll do it for everyone else. Those, el those elite people that actually can actually do PR and marketing properly and, you know, you know you know, it's interesting, and I could say for ourselves throughout the years, it's like it's like the um, shoemaker's son type of thing. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I think what sets us apart, the perception is, is that most, especially geographically, most think of us more as a PR agency, but there are a lot of cases where we become a client's like full marketing department. But I think what sets us apart in, in the PR world is that we're marketers first. And I think there's a difference when you hire a PR agency that doesn't have the marketing brain, because I will never, ever, ever send out a news release just for virtue of checking a box. You know, I'll just give you a really quick example, and this will just bring it to light. A client came to us and and said, hey, uh, this was, this was a, a, actually a geriatric center. They were partnering with a local college for a cyber senior program. And they're like, can you generate a news release? I'm like, let me think about it, bring it back to my staff because I know that that's gonna generate this much ink. And certainly it doesn't make for good TV. <laughs> I needed to create a visual. So went back to the executive director, understanding it's a nonprofit, don't wanna break the bank. And I just said, listen, this is what we'd like to do. We wanna do a graduation ceremony. So the seniors, whether they get up um, you know, to the, to the uh, university students who are gonna hand them a certificate, doesn't matter if they can walk there, they're on walker, wheelchair, that there's gonna be a transition, here's your certificate. We created a graduation ceremony. Boom, like think about it. It's like we got major camera crews there, great visuals. That's the kind of thinking that needs to go into public relations. It's like, if, if you think about it, a lot of the greatest stunts, marketing stunts, if you think about Nathan Hot Dogs, that was created by like two PR mavens. And it, it's, it's turned into like a multi, I want to say multi-million dollar, maybe it's multi-billion dollar um, annual Coney Island thing for sponsorships. And it's, it's crazy. I actually know one of the guys that, that created this. They just, they, Nathan's Hot Dogs was their client and they wanted to, to do something that would get Nathan's a lot of attention and look at what they created. Uh that's brilliant. Brilliant response. Thank you, Stacy. Stacy, we met on Clubhouse. I have to include a question about Clubhouse. What do you think about Clubhouse? Maybe 30 seconds or so. Clubhouse, I, first of all, I am so grateful for Clubhouse. I used to like live on Clubhouse <laughs> about, a, about a year, year and a half ago. And, you know, then just got really busy. But if it wasn't for Clubhouse, I would not have met people like you, David Meltzer, 
um, Natasha, I actually have to credit my, you know, first of all, you encourage, encouraging me to get back on my book. But as I had shared with you earlier before we jumped on this podcast, the woman that I met um, on Clubhouse, who president of National Speakers Association Manhattan Chapter, she introduced me to her publisher. So when I look back to a lot of my incredible connections right now, I can direct them back to Clubhouse. I'm not on as often as, as I, I was, but I think it's a great platform. And I think it has so much potential. But again, and this goes to one of my mantras, which I think applies to Clubhouse and for anyone out there. In marketing, we talk about getting a competitive advantage. The new competitive advantage is, and write this down, is about innovation and change. Because you know how we always say, if you keep doing the same thing, you'll get the same result. No, if you keep doing the same thing, you're gonna be stuck in reverse. And so, we all have to get out of our comfort level and, and we have to we have to change. We have to be comfortable with how are we gonna innovate our companies? How are we gonna change ourselves to better meet the needs of our, of our target audiences? So I feel there's, there's hope for Clubhouse to implement some kinds of, of innovation in 2023. I don't know what it looks like, but I'd be happy to speak to them. And, and Stacy's coming to my clubhouse, uh, uh, clubhouse, um, January 6th, Friday, January 6th, she will be the main guest speaker, folks. So stay tuned in the finance club, um, which was actually a continuation of the longest running room on clubhouse, basically where I met Stacy at, and, and I was with her, uh, pretty much on that app all the time. <laughs> what, so, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. So Stacy, any thoughts on that particular stage? I am so excited. We we are gonna blow up this room. The, the, What's your favorite clubhouse room, Stacy? Yours, yours, <laughs> yours, yours. I mean, I do have to say, I I, I do um, co moderate a room on Friday, which is which is great. But we're looking at changing the the uh, format of that. It's with Gene Stafford uh, on on really reinventing conversations and, and it's a great room but your room is so lively you have such incredible guests and it's just it, it's like it's I always say you know add value not clutter because there's so much clutter out there and and thank you because you have figured out how to add value by your guests and also the the thoughtful questions that that you ask yeah, it's because of you, Stacey, we had Les Brown on, and that was an incredible room that one night. We had uh, over 10,000 people in the room, and we introduced them to his hero, Dr. Bernie Siegel. I believe you're a big fan of him as well. So that was a really Yes. Cool oh, you have incredible guests. <laughs> and my, uh, my plan is going, I'm going to bring in some really powerhouse wow. media guests. And, and again, it's going to be a, an incredible experience for everyone. Thank you, Stacey. All right, folks. So, Stacy, we're going to ask her the uh, temple questions we've asked everyone from Les Brown, speaking of Les Brown, to Sharon Lecter, to Brett Farr, you name it. Uh, we, we've and David Meltzer. These questions are basically some of the highlighted questions in the finance world, writing world, entrepreneurship. What it takes to be great, pretty much. Let's start with books, okay? One can one book change the world? You're an author now. Uh, can one book change the world? Yes. Go giver. Go giver. Yeah, it's a great. Go giver, and I, I finally read that book. It's everybody should put it on on their reading list. It's a fabulous book. Folks, if you haven't read that book, check it out. The the two co authors, Bob Berg and John David Mann, have both been interviewed on this podcast. If you want to hear about their incredible stories, the book is absolutely amazing. The Go Giver. So, thank you, Stacy. Next question is uh, what role has networking played in your life? Maybe 10, 20 seconds. Networking, you know what they say, your network is, is your net worth. And um, it's, it's really key. And, and I can't emphasize enough um, to, to invest time into your network, 
and building those relationships. It really is your pot of gold. Thank you, Stacy. Um, next question, extension that is mentoring important and who are some of your mentors? Yes. Um, oh, so mentoring is, is so important. I have had so many different mentors um, throughout my career. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Some of, some of them are, some of them are clients. Um, some of them, like, I would even say that you're a mentor to me. Thank you. Oh, really? Because, because it's, it's like we met on, on clubhouse and, and I feel part of a role of a mentor is to, is to encourage and eliminate self-limiting beliefs. And I remember one of our first conversations is like, oh, I, I don't feel like this book is ever going to come out. And, and that's when you said, yes, you can do it. Yes, it will. And so having, having positive people surrounding you, and I also mentor um, a lot of, of people myself, particularly startups. I'm part of um, an incubator group, and I'm also part of an angel investors group. So I love um, helping startup companies just find their, their brand voice and um, help them with their marketing. That's awesome. Thank you, Stacey. And, and by the way, uh, you know, I just want to bring this back up again. Like, after talking to you, I already realized the only thing you were missing was motivation. Like, you had everything else. And as a writer, I know what it feels like when you're just, you know, you got something to do, but I, you're just procrastinating it for whether it's a few hours or a few days or even a week. You're like, I just got to do this. And it's so hard to get onto the computer and start typing. But once you get in that flow, it's like working out. It's the same thing. It's like, it, you're there you're already here we have to do something so then yes. you start writing for 10 minutes and next thing you know you just lose track of time and you're here for two hours i felt it's, like that was what you were missing that one just little push God, you gotta just yeah, write a chapter and, and write a page yes <laughs> yes 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 you you really you really motivated me and then you also uh, shared a great opportunity to uh you know Again, with deadlines, right? Because we all need deadlines. So deadlines to um, get these these chapters done. Yeah, especially, especially this book. 13 yes. books you got to write, folks. It, that, that is so very, very good. <laughs> what are your favorite financial books, uh, if any? Maybe uh, one or two. Oh, Business, wow. money, investing. Do you have any? I'm, I'm looking, you know, I have to tell you, one of my, my favorite books is, and it's not a financial book per se, but good to great. Okay. But I would, I would love some, re as, as my mentor, I would love some <laughs> recommendations. And I think you are about due for a new book. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. My last book I wrote was 2016. So okay, um, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, do we need money to survive? Wait, did, did you, wait, is, did you say, is that, is that a book recommendation or is that a question? Oh, that was a question. Do we need Oh, money I survive? love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, no. I mean, yeah, yes, yes and no. But when, it, how, how did I put this to you? It's so interesting because I just went to uh, see some TEDx talks and one of the talks was so inspiring and it was about like wealth and abundance but talking about how abundance isn't all about money. It's, um, if you were to ask me, you know, just about wealth, like I think we all have to be comfortable, but my priority is, is always like health because, right? It's like, I know some of the wealthiest people that have uh, really serious health issues. So, I would opt for, for health and to be hopefully not living out in the streets. Of course, we all need to sustain our, our lifestyles, but um, I also think when you're, when you're passionate about things, it's like you, you, you will create abundance. So I think there's a few things that have to, that have to come first. So you, you would say you definitely need money to pay the bills and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, to pay the bills, you know, go out to dinner once in a while. <laughs> but you, you know, I like my dinners out. <laughs> right. 
uh, as an extension of that, and this enters in my realm here, is finance necessary for everyone? Now, when I'm talking about finance, I'm talking about the science of finance, not finance being, I'm going to finance you, funding. They're talking about funding in that case. Um, finance, the science, is it necessary for everyone? How to ma learn about how to manage all this stuff, money, wealth. And a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I'm a strong believer in, um, in financial literacy and actually through some of of our clients, we were representing a, um, a credit union this is going back years ago. And I came up with the idea of another client, like a boys and girl, a local boys and girls club, the, um, you know, recognizing that, that the kids, they were actually in elementary school. We got the credit union to go over there and teach these, these kids skills on financial literacy I, I i absolutely i think it should start early i think it should really start early and you even look at like some of of the influencers and the people that have gone bankrupt it's like had they learned the science of of finance like at an earlier age um you know they they, they would have learned more how to manage their money and i think part of managing their money is is like is like serving others right it's like yes we all want to create wealth but i also know and and i do it currently with some of, of my money i give it to charities that that i like so finance as as a science and, and learning how to manage it 100 percent. stacy you're doing great we got three questions left super simple stuff how important is having a purpose in business and what is your purpose that's kind of a machine gun to package. <laughs> Great. Um, a purpose, um, very important. My my purpose is to. In one sentence, you got to say my okay, purpose. Okay, okay, okay. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. Lightning match. My my purpose is to help both individuals and and businesses. Uh, you know, package um, to, to to cultivate. Um, amplify and activate on on their um best value okay great thank you stacy all right stacy what would you like to accomplish in the next 10 years or so maybe another book a movie um i don't know anything I think 10 I, years I, I, I love i love love writing and um can definitely see another book. My second book I'm thinking about is is um, maybe for a particular category, like personal branding for for real estate. Um, just know a lot about real estate, um, but I, I want to I want to I want to help others. I you know it's like part of part of what I'm doing with the personal branding is going to charity. So uh, my uh, youth organization of choice is the Boys and Girls Clubs of, of America. So I'm going to be creating, uh, uh, donating a couple thousand books, creating a pilot program for them. And I'm also planning on, on developing an online course for or courses for personal branding. And I have someone that I'm working, uh, that I'm going to start working with from uh, who lives in Paris. Okay. I, um, I had a conversation with David Meltzer about like a lot of the, the smartest people behind the scenes and the Tim story too. And we talked about how it's, it's smarter at the highest level to find the next superstar instead of being your own superstar and to blow them up and get many of them. Right. And, and, and just basically be their, um, the power behind them. Stacy, I mean, you, you are armed with all this tools to, to create the next superstar or take a particular person and take them to the highest levels possible. Um, would, would you uh, agree with that strategy? Would that be, would you want to incorporate that in your strategy to find someone that's a diamond in the rough and, and just polish them off a little bit and make absolutely, them the next? Absolutely, absolutely. Because I know you got a New York Times article for uh, some folks on Clubhouse. I mean, you just pulled that right out of the wind. I mean, you're, you're totally capable of making anyone a, a, a superstar. So maybe you get a little. Yeah, yes. But, but again, it's all, um, it's, it's all having a great story. It mm. can't be average. It can't be good. It has to be. Wow. 
Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. I was just saying in the next 10 years though, because if you, let's say you got like five, five or 10 of these folks, this could be another, another avenue to, to, and this would be an example of what you can do. You would showcase this to everyone and say, look, I, I help produce these folks. Um, this is what I can do, you know, right? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like that we've already done it to a degree because, because again, um, you know, and we have some bigger brands, but um, always when possible, uh, the CEO getting them, them out there, media circuit, speaking at big industry conferences and, and getting um, them, them known as, as a, a brand unto themselves. Mm. Really good. Thank you, Stacey. Last question. What would you like to leave as your legacy to this world? So when you're, if you can, if you're able to come back, you know, if you passed away and you're able to come back and look at your tombstone, you wanted to say something as one message to the whole world and you hope that it really resonated. What, what, what do you want to leave as your legacy? My children, I, I mean, my, my children and everything that I've, I've poured into them and, and continue to pour into them. Like, to me, they're the most important things in, you know, in my life. There's no doubt. Thank you, Stacey. And, and, I, and I would love for, for them to in somehow, some way continue, continue my work and, and help and help others. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the exact same way, but um, I am I'm just passionate about, you know, helping helping people um, bring themselves and their businesses to, to new levels. Beautiful. Thank you, Stacy. All right, Stacy, we're, we're about to conclude here. I just want to check on your timing. I, I did save several questions I could ask you on stage. Um, do you want a bonus question or you just want to roll right into the conclusion, concluding section? Let's, I, I do have to jump off. So let's do a bonus question. Okay, we'll do one quick bonus question. Um, uh, let's see. Can you just uh, maybe tell us some best ways to get traditional media attention? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Okay, the, the best ways to get media attention is to is to look at your news value. Again, it's gotta be a 10. It's gotta be a 10. If you're, if you're, if you're doing, um, if you're not doing something different, think about the word news, right? News is new. So, uh -huh. so they're looking for some kind of innovation, some kind of, of disruption. That's the number one thing. But I think there's also an opportunity. It's something called news jacking. Have you ever heard that term? Briefly, yeah. Okay, so so news jacking is basically inserting yourself into the news cycle. So I'll give you an example for you. And there's like a national holiday for like for everything, right? So let's just say that, and I'm not even sure when it is, but I'm sure that there's like a national financial literacy month. So Dr. Finance can insert himself into the, the news cycle by figuring out what can you do that month that, that would be different or what, what solutions like could you, if you think about it, it it's like, how can you educate audiences that that need to know about financial literacy. A lot of times it's like if, if you're talking that you want to look again, this financial literacy can go from elementary school up until like retirement years. And, and so pick a particular demographic and maybe you're, here's something, here's a way you can news chat. There's been all of these stories that I've been seeing on, on the news that have been saying how a lot of people who went into retirement, unfortunately, they have to come out of retirement <laughs> because either A, they're living longer or they had some unforeseen uh, 
you know, uh, um, finances or had to take, you know, take care of someone. So how can you create something for that target audience? And it could just be, I'm just like making this up. Maybe you reach out to AARP, right? And you come to them with a program. Hi, I'm Dr. Finance. And, you know, with this, you give them a data point, right? Because, because both the media and these organizations love data points. You go to them with a data point. Okay, so here's the statistics. I would love to educate your audience how um, they can stay retired. You know, I'm just making that up, <laughs> but, but how, can they, how can they stay retired? Because there's all this news that's coming out that, that people are just coming up and, and you know, they, they, they have to come out of retirement and figure out some like side hustle. So again, that's just like one idea, but there's so many others. It's also research, research, research. Just the example that I shared with you to get into Cranes Magazine, you've got to research the reporter. Another idea, show the reporter love. Like I've spoken to so many journalists, like they want to know that you're following them, that you like their posts. The media landscape has changed so much that they need to, they need eyeballs. So when they come out with articles, they need people saying, this is a great article or to take that article and share it. So, so show the media some love is, is another tip. And the other thing is, is, is just make sure, like I see so many people that get like great media coverage and they don't do anything with it. So again, push it through your social media channels. Um, if it's really good, like even use your email signature line, right? Like if you're sending out an email signature line, that's great real estate. Um, put it, put it on your website and your bio, you know, like, like ultimately, wouldn't you like, like Dr. Finance has been featured at, you know, New York Times, Forbes, um, Bloomberg and other national media. Again, that, that builds credibility. So really get as much mileage as, as you can from, uh, from your, your media coverage. And again, it's like, talk about the, the book, Go Give, like don't, like a lot of my relationships with the media has been built by helping them. Like they know that they could come to me. And even if like they're looking for a source for their story, even if that particular client is not in my client portfolio, I know enough people in my network that I can tap into someone that, that they can speak to. So again, building those relationships is key, you know, so not just saying to the reporter, write a story about me. It's like, hey, are you working on any stories that, you know, that I can help you with? I have, you know, I have like a wide network, you know, would be happy to, you know, to help you. And um, sorry, Stacey, to interrupt you. It's, it sounds almost like a great entrepreneur in any business, taking care of your clients, keeping your ears open, actually listening to them, caring for them. Listening. Here it goes back to yes. relationships again. Yes. But you're applying it to media. Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. It's, Totally. Nothing different under the sun. <laughs> there's, there's no, absolutely. And you just, you just also want to know that, that what you provide media with great visuals are, are really important. Sometimes that can make, make or, or break getting a story. Like if you have, they just, you know what, they're, they're so stretched. The more you can provide them with, uh, you know, with visual assets or video in some cases, the better. So again, just like think about how can you how can you make their job easier? That's brilliant. Thank you, Stacy. And Stacy, I want to conclude and say thank you so much for being on this podcast. I'm honored to have you here. And um, you know, we've we've been on probably hundreds, if not, I don't know, thousands of days, who's counting on Clubhouse over the past like about two years. Um, so it's it's uh it's been a journey and I'm 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 honored to finally have you here. This was a great episode. I can't wait to uh, interview you on stage and hang out with you if, when you're the main guest speaker um, on January 6th. Any last concluding remarks or anything before we, before we wrap up today? The floor is yours. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. And I'm I am so inspired and impressed like with, with, the, with the growth of your clubhouse room and, and really like the quality of, of guests. 
And I, I probably would just like to wrap it up by again, saying thank you. And I'm so glad that I met you on Clubhouse and just to the audience that's out there. It's like, like, again, I think the whole crux of this conversation is like, we're living in such a cluttered world that, that let these four words guide you and they are add value, not clutter. And that's how I would like to end our little segment. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Stacy. Where can they get more information about you? you have a website or um, how yes, about your social media? Yes, sure. Co-communications, co-communications.com. And also I have um, a website, stacyrosscohen.com. Um, follow me on Instagram, Stacy Ross Cohen. Of course, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, and I really look forward to our room january and blowing it out of the water <laughs> that's awesome stacy and one last shout out to your book what was the name of it again that's coming up pretty soon grant up the ultimate playbook college and career success in the digital world wow such a necessary book all right that's incredible thank you so, so great to to catch up all right stacy if you can hang on just for one second i'm going to conclude here folks doc you've been listening to dr anthony Trinity the fourth also known as Dr. Finance, and this is the Dr. Finance Live podcast. Check out the information on the website, drfinance.info. Also, don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe, and comment on these videos. We're going to blast it out to YouTube and 20-plus podcast directories very soon, so definitely stay tuned. Um, and also, if you're interested in learning about finance, here are my three books I wrote as a finance professor about 10 years ago. So it started with The Necessity of Finance, uh, which is to indicate how important finance is, and separated as a science from economics. And then I led to most important lessons in economics and finance, 218 principles that lasted 2000 years ago and hopefully will last 2000 years from now. And then my final uh, seminal work is um, the survival of the richest 500 plus page book that really tied economics, finance, biology, uh, and survivalism and saving the world all in one book. Imagine that. So <laughs> check it out, folks, if you want to learn more. Thank you so much again. We're going to see you on the next episode. Thanks again, Stacey. Thanks again. Bye-bye, Thank everyone. Bye.